I think the American dream is being able to do what you love to do versus what you have to do. You know, like, you know, like I told you, I, I do all this essentially uh, voluntarily and it's more fulfilling than any job I ever had in my life. Hey there, welcome back to another episode of American Snippets. I'm your co-host, Barb Allen, here today with Jeremy Harrell, who founded Veterans Club in 2017 after he came back from or transitioned out of the military, went through many of the struggles that our veterans today go through in that transition, recognized the need, didn't wait for others to fill it, stepped up to fill it himself and is doing some really cool exciting, awesome things. We're going to talk to Jeremy about his time in service, what drove him to serve, the work he's doing now, the struggles he had, how veterans and non-veterans can relate to that, and some lessons he has for how to deal with struggles that, bring, that are brought upon us by change in life, sudden change, sudden loss of purpose, and maybe some tips for people on how to start their own nonprofit work or jump in and address a problem that they see in their lives or their community. Jeremy happened to do it largely with horses, which I love and I'm excited to talk about. And I'm uh, glad that we have the chance to sit, sit down and talk with you today, Jeremy. Thank you for joining us. Absolutely. I'm excited. Thank you. Yeah. So let's get started first. You are a veteran in the United States Army. Yes. Yes. Yep. How long did you serve? Nine years. Served nine years in the Army. Nine years. And what prompt, what I like to ask people who serve. Everybody's got different reasons. Sometimes there's a recruiter walking down the hallway promising them that they <laughs> score. Other times it was like family service. So, you know, I'm always interested in uh, what and what drove you to to decide to take that leap in the first place. Well, you know, I learned at a very early age that I had, I had a servant's heart. You know, I just, I was always uh, wanting to do something for somebody. Uh, even in high school, I would go and, and deliver groceries to uh, senior living apartment complexes. Just, just on your own? So, yeah, I just wanted to do something good. I wanted to do something bigger than me. And so that was really the, the reason why I joined. And I also, I mean, I wanted to, to, to go out and see the world. You know, I hadn't been out of Kentucky very much at that point. And uh, I was like, well, this is, this is one way to do it. Like, I can go see the world. Unfortunately, some of the parts of the world that I got to see wasn't the good parts. But however, I did get to, you know, the experiences I'll never, never want to trade out for anything. And so just wanted to do that. I just wanted to go see the world and serve my country. So you're in high school and four kicks. I have to harp on this because, you know, I am a mom of four and uh, one of them is still in high school. The other three are moved on to college. But so you're in high school, you're a dude in high school and you have time on your hands and you say, I'm going to go deliver groceries to elderly people in the community. How, yeah. I do. I, this is fascinating. <laughs> I, know, I, know. It, but I need to go. In. So how did you like <laughs> nobody prompted you to do that? You just saw. No, I just I just know that that. You know, we don't get a whole lot of snow here in Kentucky, but we do get some. And, and uh, there was an opportunity to do that. Uh, my grandmother lived in that complex. Okay. And uh, I know that how it was hard for her to get around. And I'm like, you know, while I'm here, why don't I just go knock on doors and see who needs something? And run oh, up to the great. store and come back. It was just, I don't know, just, I've always just had that desire yeah. to do that. It's pretty, I mean, I can't even explain it. It's just something I like to do. So Nice. Your brothers, sisters? I don't have any brothers or sisters. I'm the only child. So the only child, not spoiled, but actually goes back to give back, breaking all the stereotypes out there. That's great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, so you're in high school. Did you enlist, um, you know, did you sign on that dotted line while you're still in high school, uh, or did you wait till you got out? No, I was, I was actually a senior in high school, and um, the funny part is I didn't ask anybody for their advice, really. I, I went into the recruiting station one day, and within a couple of hours, I was in the delayed entry program. And then I was like, well, I guess I should probably tell my mom, right? That, probably. <laughs> and her initial was, reaction was like, are you kidding? Like, you didn't even want to tell me about, you know, you know, just the kind of the shock of it. But then she realized how much I wanted to do it. And, you know, being the mom that she is, she was very supportive. Um, yeah. You know, I know that we like to think that our kids tell us everything or at least tell us the most important <laughs> things. I'm learning in, uh, in hindsight, kids are like, oh, by the way, I did that, 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 that. I'm like, oh, OK, I guess we didn't really have that open door that I thought we we had going on. So surprise, mom. Uh, that must have been a good one for her. 
Oh, I was. It was. It took her a couple of days to get past it. You know, she just kept saying she would just look over at me and be like, "I just can't believe that you just did that without asking me." You know, and so I was like, "Hey, you know, I want to do something good. I want to do something great. I want to go." You know, and so she was good with that. Right, and that was in '99, and it was like yep. in our you know peaceful times, so to say, right before yeah. everything uh, sort of ex- you know, went nuts around us. So tell us about your your service and some of the things that happened in service. Is there a moment that hit you? Yeah, you know, um, we deployed during the initial invasion um, in 2003, 2004. I didn't, I didn't know exactly what to expect. I was, I think, 21 years old. Uh, I had a birthday over there, but I was 21 when I went and I uh, was kind of excited, right? I was a young guy and I've been training for this uh, most of my, or my whole adult life, right? And I was like, all right, you know, we get to go do what we train to do. And, um, but I didn't realize uh, how impactful it would be both in a positive way, but also in a negative way, right? Like it, it's, it's different uh, when you're uh, in a training environment and there's really no threat to you, right? And yeah. you're able to do so many good things, but it's, it's different when the threat's out there and they're watching for you every single day. And, and that takes a toll on you mentally um, to be, to be in fear for such a long period of time, I think was, was really detrimental to my mental health while I was there and, and, and really kind of, took me down a dark road, so to speak. And just, just, it was negative. Like, you imagine the most negative place in the world. That was it, right? Like the Mecca of negativity and violence and death and all those things. And so it was, it was hard to, to process. Yeah. And, you know, I spent a few years working as a veteran services officer in my County and working with hundreds of veterans coming in. And that was one of the, you know, the VA has their check box, you know, their marks, they like to put everything right. in a box and check the box and all this. And right. one of those, um, when you're filing for you know, a particular claim was that you, you, if you were in constant fear for your life or for your, uh, your safety, that counted. Like they actually counted that as as like yeah. a requirement to file for that particular you know, service connected disorder. They called it. And uh, so I would speak with uh, you know so many of our veterans, and they they talk about that as well. Just living in the constant, you can never relax. So you're just worried all yeah. the time. And then so you come home. And that you can't just flip that switch off. You know, you've lived in this heightened state of awareness and anxiety and just, stress, and you're like, you know, like this all the time. And then someone says, okay, it's fine now. And you're, you're still all like kind of jacked up, like on alert and hyper. How, how do you, how do you learn to dim that, dim that response or dim that condition? Well, to be honest, it took me years to figure that out. And, and there's still times, uh, Rarely that they come up where I, I kind of get back to that place, but it was a <laughs> it was a long process. Um, it, it was things that would happen that I wouldn't even foresee being an issue, right? Because you come home and and I remember uh, getting home and the very next couple of days I would call people like at three thirty four o'clock in the morning, you know, and, <laughs> and people would answer it was like Jeremy, you, you all right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. What are you doing? Like what are you doing? You want to do something, you know? And people are like, we're sleeping, you know, like yeah. just, it was just, it, but I was like, why are you sleeping? Like, why sleep? Like I, I hadn't had, had sleep in 400 some days, right? It's yeah. just like good sleep, you know? And so, and then I couldn't sleep because of uh, a lot of the fears of sleeping and trying to uh, worry about what am I going to dream about? You know, what's going to pop into my head when I lay down and, and the fear of that made me kind of, have insomnia, right? And so then I wanted everybody to join me because I had been around my brothers and, and sisters for that long, and I always and had they someone. Sleeping either. Yeah. No, they weren't. And they were living with me, like in a yeah. cot right next to me. So I didn't know what to do about here. I'm in this house by myself. Um, what do I do now? So that was just the beginning of it, and then just noticing little things that triggered uh, different um, responses from me, and, and going, "Why does that bother me so much? Why does a smell of something?" Like really take me back to a to a dark place, and I remember um, going to work at, at UPS, and uh, they had this this agreement with a university here in Kentucky, and they had like night school, right? And, and uh, it was it was uh, UPS is near the airport, and I remember getting out of my car and looking at this this um, air traffic control tower and just breaking down, and I'm like, why why am I breaking down right now? Well, the reason why is because when we would come out of Iraq and go to Kuwait and get resupplied with things. I would always like one of the, I think it's um, Arif John or Camp Wolf. I can't remember exactly, but I would look at that air traffic control and be like, I'm so close. 
to being able to hop on a plane and get out of this place, right? And so that stuck with me, but I knew I had to go right back in country, right? As soon as we got what we needed. And so that's one of those weird things. And I'm looking yeah. at this church and I'm breaking down and I'm crying. I'm like, why am I doing this? And so that was, that was when I started realizing that there's some stuff I need to deal with. Yeah. And so how, how did you go about, I mean, talk about in those years then, so now you're, you're figuring this out about yourself, but the people right. around you, you know, family, friends, co-workers, how was it, you, know, you got the job in the first off, which a lot of uh, people even struggle to do is to get that, right. that job. So how, how was that? Like, re, did the other people around you understand what it was you were dealing with or going through? <laughs> Unfortunately, they did not, um, not even close, really. I mean, I think they had empathy uh, for the situation. You know, I always use an analogy like I've never had a broken arm, but I assume it, it probably sucks and I assume it hurts. But I don't know the emotional part about not being able to use your arm right. every day. Right. And so I think that they knew they were they were like, oh, I'm sorry about that, you know, and, and it was was caring. But I don't think they really understood the the dynamic of it. And, and so. <laughs> um, it was just hard to do my job in the, in the way that I was supposed to, I was a you know, supervisor. And so I only knew one way to lead. Right. And it wasn't like <laughs> with compassion, really. Right. It was like, Hey, we need this done. Or yeah. somebody would say, Hey, hey, Jeremy, I need to leave today. Like I'm not feeling good. I have some stomach issues. And I'm like, okay. All right. What's that Suck mean? it up buttercup. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right in the bathroom. Let's go. Let's, let's, yeah. you know, and then <laughs> after several conversations with our HR department <laughs> and, and them saying, Jeremy, your employees are saying that you're unapproachable. And I'm like, what? I'm not trying to be that way. And I wasn't trying to be that way facetiously. I was just, that's all I knew, right? It's yeah. mission, 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 mission. We'll worry about the rest later. And so it was, it was a huge transitional process that was, it was a giant to overcome, to be honest with you. Yeah. And you know, so you got out in 2008 and I feel like in the time since then, maybe in those earlier years, there was less awareness and less public support for our veterans and what they go through. And a lot of the stuff you're saying, I can actually relate to when my husband was killed, I went through a lot of the same for different reasons, but you know, the sleeplessness, the awareness, the alert, the people not being able to understand, even though they wanted to. So in a sense, I can understand that disconnect you have between yourself and literally every single person around you, because there's just nobody nobody can break nobody can understand truly um and and really know how to relate unless you've actually been there people can try and some people are better at it than others right some people have a natural tendency um but i know that like for me i felt that anger for at some point i would just get pit you know like my sister would call up every day she'd be like how are you doing today and i would answer her and answer and answer and then one day i was like well how do you think i'm doing did you know and i would just explode and she had no idea right? right so i that's that's we all try to find a way to kind of connect. And for me, that's the experience I draw upon when I was connecting with the veterans and helping them file for the claims and counseling through their crisis. I don't, like you said, I don't have the broken arm, but I've had some of the symptoms of a broken arm. So I try to relate to that and connect. Right. And I've watched it change and grow since the years I worked professionally and then the work I do now. And I've seen this explosion of organizations established to Mm -hmm to provide the services and be that resource that our government is not. And maybe to some extent, the government shouldn't be wholly responsible for, for every single need. Right. But certainly I feel like they could do a lot more, but absolutely, you know, they're not doing it. So people are coming forward to step up. And in these past 10 or 11 years, I've seen so many organizations and so many people come forward to be that need to fill that hole, to plug that gap. And right. most recently, there's an emergence of equine therapy programs. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. And some of them are great and some of them are are not. So you are one of the better ones and you've been acknowledged for such. You're Kentucky veteran of the year, correct? Yeah. Yeah. That's what they call me. Yeah. That's what they call me. There are a lot more stuff you could be called. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, My wife tells more people than me. I get embarrassed when she she likes to brag about it. And I'm just like, ah, you don't have to say that, you know? Um, no, one of the, two of the things that, that I want to talk to you about, yeah. uh, since we were talk, kind of on that path of, of the, the, the symptoms of, of kind of trauma that, that encouraged me to do this was, um, I felt like it was two things. Number one, I felt like a foreigner in my own country, 
start coming back. I felt like nobody, I couldn't communicate and I didn't know how to communicate anymore. And I didn't know what is it? Cause I went, when I went, I was, you know, 21 years old and you know, I'm still young. Right. And that's, that's still a, a monumental part of your life where you're figuring everything out. And so I didn't communicate well with people. The other part of that was I felt like a casualty of war, even though I was alive, you know, and I, and I mentioned that in a docu film that I did, I just really did. I, I felt like I walked around like a zombie. Like I'm just, nobody can see me. Nobody can hear me, you know, and I'm over here like, hey, I need you. I need you. And that kind of thing. So that's what inspired me to do what I'm doing now. I just wanted to touch on that before we went forward. In no, the I'm glad you did because I think that there are a lot of people, whether they're a veteran or not, who can relate to that. I always kind of compare it to silent drowning. You know, like somebody can literally be a foot away from you and a child could be drowning and you don't know because they look just like every other swimmer out there, right? But they're right. actually in grave danger. And and I think that it's important for people to understand that. And certainly people who haven't served experience that too, but absolutely people who have served and done so on our behalf and are now suffering these symptoms right. and conditions because you went out there and did what you did for the rest of us need that support and deserve Absolutely. that support um so much so i'm glad that you identified it and came came forward to you know to be that person how did you get started you started this uh, you know this veterans club yeah that's that was your baby your idea your vision did you, who was in on the ground floor with you so it started out just myself you know i went to uh I went out to a, another equine program out in Kansas uh, called War Horses for Veterans. And um, I had no horse experience. Like I hadn't even touched a oh, horse. Seriously? Seriously, I hadn't even been- Kentucky, a, you had yeah. to go to Kansas to ride us. <laughs> I did, because yeah, I grew I up in the, in the city, you know? And I mean, yeah. I went to Churchill Downs, right? That was yeah. my experience with horses. And so my wife though, she's showing horses, dressage, all that, you know, fancy horse stuff, you know? And so she, she we were having a bad week and she said, Jeremy, I really think that you should, uh, you know, go to a place that has equine therapy. She said, I really think that that would help you. And it wasn't on my list to do, to be honest. And it's not because I didn't like horses, but I just didn't know about them. Right. And so, but I understand that uh, happy wife, happy life, you know, and I said, sure, I'll, <laughs> I'll apply for that. Right. So I applied it. And re in reality, I was hoping that they would not call me. I really yeah. was. I didn't tell her that till later, but uh, and the <laughs> funny thing is, you know, it just works out like that. Got called a couple of days later. There was a guy who was supposed to go who canceled. And Patrick, who is the, the founder out there, was like, hey, Jeremy, we'd like for you to come out. I'm like, oh. Well, I had him on speakerphone, so I couldn't really deny that. <laughs> so my wife was like nodding, like, yes, you know, go. And so I went out there, and, and uh, I just couldn't get out of the barn. It was a, it was a weekend thing, you know, and, and they had, you know, we did a lot with horses, but they also had a lot of other stuff going on in, in the, on the farm. And I just, I just couldn't leave the barn. And I was like, there's something about this. Like, there is something about this. I can't put my finger on it yet, but why do I not want to leave? Yeah. Why am I not thinking about these things at home that's really stressing me out? So um, I left there and went uh, to a another place because I was really like going through some things and I was really like looking for programs to help me out. And, what are, can I ask you what some of those things are? Are you open to being a little more specific? Absolutely. Like, you know, the, the hypervigilance, yeah. uh, the, the, the depression for feeling like I can never get better, you know, um, and, 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 and actually having a, a clinician tell me that one time was very, my very first therapy session took me six years to go to therapy. And the only reason I did that because one of my bosses was a retired Marine and he was like, Jeremy, you got some cognitive stuff going on. You really need to go get checked out. And so I was like, ah, okay, you know, I'll do it. The first session, she's like, we're not going to be able to help you or get rid of that, but I'll teach you how to manage it. And so that was my first therapy session ever, right? And I'm like, what am I, what am I doing here then? And so I quit going there, right? And, and then I started going to these programs. And so I was just trying to, uh, to find a way to have peace, you know, yeah. to find a way to adjust to what they were saying my new normal was. And I don't believe in that anymore, right? I've come a long way since then. But uh, so anyway, I went to, to New York and, and uh, Patrick called me and said, hey, listen, we want you to come back. Uh, to the ranch because we're going to do a Megan Kelly uh, Today Show thing and we want you to represent us. And I'm like, are you insane? Like, uh, I've been around a horse for five minutes. Like, <laughs> I'm the wrong guy. And he goes, no, he goes, you know, you're a natural at this. And the way that you, you know, connect it with the horses, I want you to talk about that, right? And I was like, you know, I'm oh, sure I'll do, I'll do it, I guess, right? I'm an introverted guy, you know, really introverted. But I was like, yeah, I'll do that. So flew back and 
we're sort of doing the interview and and uh, we get done with that and it airs a few days later and I'm already back home at this time and then Megan Kelly decides that she wants to say and Jeremy's going to do this in his home state of Kentucky and I'm like oh I get, am I <laughs> <laughs> that's what Surprise. I'm yeah so i'm like well i don't have one horse or farm i live in the middle of louisville's the biggest city in kentucky right yeah. um but you know i just i just prayed about it and, and my wife has these friends you know the horse community you know is very tight right and so she just reached out and said hey we want to do this can we do this at your farm I'm like yeah i went to go buy a horse and the guy's like no but what you're doing you just take the horse just send me a t-shirt and i'm like that's awesome I can do that. Now I got to make a t-shirt, but okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 right. No, you're right. I did. And I was like, you want two of them? I'll send you two of them. Right. So anyway, we did that. And, and then we just been very blessed. And, and the, the community has believed in what we do. And they've just come together. And, and it just, it's just grown from there. And then we do the other stuff, you know, the camaraderie building stuff, the family uh, bonding things as well. And so it just makes this whole cyclic version of healing because they come out for the equine sessions and they get to know each other and then they start going to our other events. And so mm -hmm. we're just this big family. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So you've mentioned your wife a bunch of times. How did you meet her and wh <laughs> what part in this process of service and transitioning did you meet her? Yeah. So I, was, I met her, we, we've been married uh, for almost two years. We've been together uh, over three years. Uh, so it was after my service that I met her, thankfully. Right. Yeah. <laughs> The service and marriage sometimes uh, it's, a, it's a rough deal, right? But yeah. uh, I, I met her through a mutual friend and, and uh, we just connected and uh, she had no experience or even idea like military culture. Right. Like nobody she knew had ever served, you know, that kind of thing. And so <laughs> I had to have, she had to transition into that life. Yeah. Right? Like, yes. like Jeremy, yeah. why, why, why do you want to set? this way like why can't you ever set to, you know with your back towards the door and why do you look around all the time and you know that kind of stuff and i just yeah. and uh just had to really work through that but she's been super supportive she's been great and so she uh she's a big part of what we do i mean she don't she don't get on the camera and that kind of thing but i tell you she keeps me in line in a lot of ways and kind of keeps yeah. me grounded and and with with the horse stuff you know she's taught me a lot of stuff you know and i've been to a couple uh, clinics and, and Patrick, we still talk out of War Horses. We're, we're essentially community partners in that way. And so it's, that's just kind of how it is. And we just do this together. She actually worked for a nonprofit, uh, a veteran nonprofit. So this was a family event. Yeah. She's since, she since left. She's going to school now to do some occupational therapy. But um, yeah, no, it's, that's, that's how we kind of got it all together. That is cool. And to have that thing that you didn't have and now suddenly you're introduced to horses. Now you do have this common thing. Yeah. That's all you know, that's great to have that, you know, that foundation there, that link that you can both talk about and grow from and learn from together. And you can kind of marry one person's passion with the other person's passion experience and, right. and go for it. That works out awesome. Well, and what's strange about that is she, she was like, Jeremy, I, I thought like I would never be back in the horse world again. Like I, I thought that was kind of that chapter was closed in my life. And she was like, I was sad about that because I Aww. I loved it. And she, she actually ponied horses at Churchill Downs. So like she would pony them to the gate during the yeah. derby and stuff like that, you know? And she's like, I just thought that part of my life was over. And she says, then I meet this guy who's never been around horses. And also, <laughs> like, around horses and she, she, it was good for her, you know, and, and good for yeah. me. And so we had that common ground that we both get the results different, but the same kind of results from being with horses and, and that kind of thing. So. Yeah. And you know, um, I'm a horse person. I've been around horses. My, my whole life as well. And, um, you know, I have a couple horses now and I work with my friends equine rescue and I, I can tell for sure. And at one point I volunteered at an, a hippotherapy it was called for, oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, volunteered at that way back in my, you know, five lives ago. But, mm -hmm. um, I can tell you there is something about and people maybe don't understand if you haven't been around horses, they're so sensitive to, oh, yeah. to moods and stuff. So the two horses I have one horse, yeah, he's like pretty, he's like golden retriever. It takes a, like a really totally jacked up person to like jack him <laughs> up. Right. right. Um, but the other horse, it, he's like, just like, a, he's out there. It's just like the most high strong thing ever. And if you don't come in five degrees lower than he is like five degrees right. chiller than he is, you have to get your own baseline down, man. They, they respond and it's For crazy sure. how they respond to your energy and all that. The people that you've had coming in, are they surprised when they see that? Like, do they, do they even notice like, oh my God, why is this horse? Like, is a horse 
super like jittery around one person and then chill around another and and do the people see that yeah absolutely and and you know what's cool what we know about horses is they have their own individual personalities right yes. and so, uh and temperaments and so um what's cool about our program is we're a very like hands-on program so like we teach basic horsemanship as well and, and we're out there getting dirty and we're i think veterans just want to do that they want to put their hands in things and so that's kind of how we run the program but a lot of times we'll go catch the horse you know and and uh, that, that oftentimes don't want to be caught, right? We have some horses like to be out. They don't like to be in a stall or in the barn and any of that. And so there's a lot of frustration sometimes that, that comes in. They're like, well, what, what am I supposed to do now? Like, I'm like, well, here's the deal. The horse, it's not a poodle. You can't go pick it up. So you're going to have to be really authentic with yourself and figure out why that horse don't want to be a part of our herd right now. And uh, you're going to have to do some introspective stuff to figure that out. And, and so we just start talking about it, right? And, and a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, kind of scared it's a huge animal you know and i see all these videos on youtube where people get kicked by them and these things you know and so we'll talk through that and what's interesting is as we're talking through that the horses come kind of, because we're, we're we're lowering our anxiety and we're being you know authentic and transparent with each other and they want to be a part of that and and sometimes they'll go well that's weird like they just come over and sometimes you know they'll put their nose on their shoulder and kind of freaks them out i'm like no that's a ultimate sign of, of trust and that you joined up with a horse and and uh, they, they just know that you're not going to eat them now. Yeah. That's weird. <laughs> that you're going to eat them. Now they know you, you're not. And so then we, that starts, that starts the, the day for us of working with them. And, and uh, they, they learn that um, at different levels all throughout the day. And so it's really cool to watch them go, wow, I had no idea that horses were this intuitive and they were this smart, you yeah. know. And I just seen them run around a circle, you know. That's majority, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, it's pretty that interesting. That is funny. So you've, since uh, you're, you're a 501c3 now? I am. Yeah. Yeah. That was a long time coming. Yeah. How was that process and what made you decide to go from this kind of informal to formal program? Well, it's funny because I never wanted to be a 501c3. I wanted this to be so organic. Mm -hmm. Right. And my fear was if I make this formal and then I have to give myself a formal title and then I don't want people to look at me as, as, as chairman. I want them to look at me as my brother, like my buddy, you know, And, and I was worried that, that, going that route would, would, uh, make that happen. But then the realism of Jeremy, this is growing and, uh, I, I could no longer use my own money, especially with, you know, some nudges from my wife. Like, Hey, we have four kids and come on, you know, I know That's you love this. But, yeah. So anyway, uh, I was like, well, I guess, I guess I should do this. And, and we did it. And I mean, the process was, it was, it was long, I think nine months. And I, from what I understand, like that's even kind of quick. Um, and just having to, you know, it, it was, and it was also hard for me to get behind having to ask a group of people what to do when that, cause I'm, I'm like on the fly guy. Like if somebody was to call me and say, Hey, Jeremy, I got this veteran in Missouri and, and they need help with something. I'm, I'm always like, Oh, good. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll do that. Well now, you know, I have to go, well, wait a minute, <laughs> let me, let me get with the, and, and they're all doing their thing, right. Their business right. owners working. And so I have to wait for responses and, I'm like, it's really helped my patience to be honest. Cause I'm like, Oh, come on. Like I just need one more guy uh-huh. uh, and then we're going to go with it and that kind of thing. But no, I mean, it's uh, it was necessary for the growth uh, because, you know, we need funding, obviously just like most 501 C's. That's how we, we run off solely donations and we're all volunteer. Like, yeah. So I don't get paid for any of the stuff I do. I do it really just because I love to serve veterans. And, and uh, so, yeah, so that's just kind of how it went, but I was very reluctant for a long time to do that because I just love the organic part of it. Yeah, I don't blame you. So what do you do now? Like, what's your day job, so to say? Like, so I'm, I'm medically retired from the Army. Yeah. And so I, I received a retirement from them, um, which allows me to do this kind of thing, you know. And, and Perfect. I think, I think it's a blessing. Yeah. And so there for a while, like, I, I was 29 years old when they retired me. And so, you know, we always say, hey, you know, I can't wait till the day comes. We don't have to work anymore, right? Like, we always say that. But yeah. it was terrible for me because I'm an ambitious guy, yep. you know. I'm a go-getter and, and I'm 29, right? And so everybody I know is out getting after it, right? And raising families and, and trying to build, you know, climb a career ladder. And I'm over here like, what am I going to do now? And so I got very, very depressed about that, like very yeah. depressed. And, and uh, so then I was like, you know what? I'm still going to serve. I'm going to pretend like <laughs> the money that I get from the army is your job. pays me to do this because right. I think God opened this door for me and I'm a faithful guy. So I'm like, I'm, I feel like God put me in a position where it's like, all right, Jeremy, I'm going to take care of this part for you and your family. Now go out and do the work for me, right? And so that's that's I embrace that. 
That is so great. How old are your kids? So <laughs> I have three girls and a boy. And uh, the, the girls are 17, 15, 12, and my son is 10. So it's, uh, it's pretty, pretty crazy around here sometimes, to be honest with you. And you know what? The Army didn't teach me how to raise teenage girls. I'll be honest. Like that's Nobody teaches you how to raise teenagers. <laughs> I got a teenage boy. Or now, you know, two of them are 20 or 120, whatever. But, dude, that's, that's like a, de- a whole different kind of being in the trenches. Um, it is. Yeah. yeah. But doing one makes me brutal. better at the other. You know, the patient, we'll do oh, one, yeah, the patients thing, right? So I have all these things like working on patients for me, you know, like, so it's, uh, it's interesting. It keeps me busy. You know, I don't get bored. No, <laughs> no, bored is not something that happens for me. Right. It's like, I feel like this last one is just scraping the bottle of my patient's barrel and like, dude, I was patient for three kids. I get like, I'm out. You're out of luck. I'm sorry. What do you want me to tell you? Like we're sold out. We're sold out of patients. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, there's, there's times where I've went downstairs in the basement and, and my daughter had been, you know, you could tell she'd been crying. And I'm like, what's, yeah. what's going on? And she goes, I don't know. You know, I FaceTime my friend and we were just crying at each other. And I'm like, you don't know why? She, I don't know why. I'm like, wow. <laughs> at that point, I'm like, Aaron, <laughs> Aaron I you. I'm tapping out. Like, I don't understand. There's no reason to cry. They just cry to each other and got off the phone, whatever that looks like, you know, so. <laughs> I'm learning all this as I go. Baptism by fire, right? So, no kidding. That's when I go out back and I start shoveling the horse paddock. I'm like, there just you go. go. Just, exactly. just, I'm going to go shovel some horse crab for an hour and I will be a much better person when I come back inside. Yeah. Even if I smell worse, I'm going to be better, <laughs> right? Be better. So tell me about some of the other things that you all do at, at Veterans Club and where do you look to go from here? So we, we want to we grow. Um, in the way that we want to have weekend retreats, right? We want uh, veterans to be able to come and spend the weekend with us. And then we add in some of our other programming during that weekend, such as, I mean, we do warrior yoga. We want to add that in. I teach classes, um, life skill classes. We want to tie that in, right? And, And just have some other creative art right? Art therapy, you know, different things. We want to create a weekend retreat for these, these folks. And so they get the most out of the, out of the process. But right now, until we get to that point, which we're very close right now, we do, um, we go to the gun range every other Tuesday and depending on who provides the food, we have good partners. Mission Barbecue is a big partner for us. And so it's either bullets and barbecue or it's pistols and pizza, right? Depending <laughs> on who's, depending <laughs> on who's, who's dinner That's is great. So, That's great. Uh, we partner up with with Louisville Armory and they allow veterans to come in and use any of their weapons, uh, any of the ranges, all that kind of stuff free of charge. And and then we, so we, we get together, we eat, I talk about gun safety, right? Just a reminder. It's kind of a little plug that I get to put in, uh, hand out some gun locks sometimes and we eat a good meal and then we go and, and we, you know, build confidence and throw some rounds down range, AKA range therapy is kind of what we call it. And, uh, Mm -hmm. So we do that. And one of the coolest things we do is we do monthly cookouts uh, for families. And I, we really believe, uh, and I specifically believe that um, the whole family serves, you know, and, and, and we want to be supportive for the whole family, the veteran. There's a lot of programs out there for veterans now. Um, and we do a lot for veterans, but we also want to do things for spouses and children, right? We want to create that connection for them so that they have a support uh, as well. And so it's just real cool that we all get together, sometimes 70 or 80 of us, right? We're, we're at a park and we're grilling up some food and you just see each other's kids, like just really playing with each other, getting to know each other. And it's just really cool. We're just trying to create a family. I, I like to say family versus organization depending yeah. on the venue and, yeah. and what I'm doing, but that's, that's really what we're trying to do is, is the foundation is forging those bonds with one another. Um, and ultimately it's to lower the, the suicide rate, you know, most veterans. And I think isolation is the key to that because I was a guy who was in the basement for the majority of my twenties, uh, wondering if it's the day, the day that I want to end it. And, um, if I just had one person or, you know, come in and say, Hey, and I eventually did, but going through that, if I would allow, I should say allowed, right. Cause there were people right. who helped me, but if I would allow somebody to come in and say, Hey, listen, let's, uh, let's go do something. You know, I, I might've done that. Right. I, I might've been able to come out of that. And so the other reason we do the monthly cookouts and, and people laugh at this, but, there's always a, a, a method behind the madness is I know that if, if, if the spouses and the, the kids get connected and say, Joe don't want to come cause he's, he's in a funk, right? He just don't want to come, but, but his wife wants to hang out with my wife. Who's going to be the most successful in getting him out of the house. It ain't going to be me. 
Right. right? We do what, what our wife tells us to do if we're smart, right? So <laughs> she's like, hey, I'm going to go, like, let's go. And then that gives me FaceTime right. with that person. And I can say, hey, man, so how's it going? And, and so that's the other reason we do it. So we do that. We do some uh, recreational activities, uh, sometimes hike. We're trying to get a big camping trip together. But there's really no limitation. Anytime an opportunity comes up for us to serve veterans in any way, we just hop on it. So our mission statement's huge, right? Like, yeah. like when I was doing a nonprofit, they're like, what do you do exactly? And I'm like, and they, you know, they would A, B, C, and I'm all the way here in F. And I'm like, you know what? I just want to do whatever it takes. Right. Like, whatever it takes to bring relief to these families and these veterans, I'm going to do it. I don't want to be in a scope of anything. I don't want to be a yeah. one trip pony, so to speak. I want to be able to do what it takes. So that's awesome. What so here at American Snip, it's part of uh, an important reason why we started it is because we believe that the, you know, contrary to what's being fed us out there, we believe that, you know, this country is basically full of good people, yes. rebuilding their lives, learning, growing. You are a great example of that. And, uh, and we believe the American dream is also alive and well. And you're living, you know, your own version of that now, even though it's hard earned and maybe not easy to maintain. Right. but you got to work for it. So we're living our version of the American dream. And Absolutely. we like to ask people, what does that mean to you? What does the American dream mean to you? I think the American dream is being able to do what you love to do versus what you have to do. You know, like, you know, like I told you, I, I do all this essentially uh, voluntarily and it's more fulfilling than any job I ever had in my life. Um, and I, I never once have thought, man, you know, I should get paid for all this stuff. Like I'm putting in like 60 hours a week and I'm, you know, doing all this kind of stuff. I never once thought that because I'm actually loving what I'm doing. And, I, and I'm not saying that everybody should do everything for free. That's not what I mean. Right. But I mean, if, if it's less about money when it's something about what you love to do. And I think the American dream is figuring that out, however, whatever it looks like. And sometimes we have to go through struggles and challenges to really understand what is it that, that we want to do? What is it that our passion uh, is behind? And then go out and do that. And if you can make good money doing that, then, then that's a bonus. But it's just, and it's, it's mentally helpful, right? Like for me, somebody who was struggling with PTSD, I'm diagnosed with PTSD and struggling with that. But when I'm helping other people, I'm not thinking about my struggle, right? I'm, I'm so focused on the other person. And then the other part of that, it makes the struggles that I've had not be in vain, right? Because even though they were tough, I learned so much from those, the, the what to do and what not to do and kind of how to process certain things. And so now I'm able to share that knowledge with some of the younger veterans or maybe some, some veterans who hadn't got help in a long time. And now they're finally going, hey, Jeremy, what can I do? You know, I, I just spoke to a gentleman last night who was who's now addicted to the stuff as part of our organization, just work with him and going, I would not be able to counsel this guy in this way had I not suffered from some of these things, you know, and, and really like peeling back the onion because a lot of times and a lot of programs are like, so, so, Hey, how, how you go, how you doing? Like, what is it that brings you out here? Well, our, our go-to as veterans, cause we're stubborn and we're knuckleheads. A lot of times we go, Oh, I'm, I got anxiety. I don't leave it there. Like that, I'll tell them, this is not a hug a vet program. This is a poke a vet program. I am going to hug you, but first I'm going to poke you, right? And so we start getting into it. And I'm like, no, okay, so I get that you're anxious, but what causes it? And then we'll end up on a patrol in Baghdad and this happened. And, and I'm like, this is what is the problem, not anxiety. Like understand, anxiety is a symptom of that, but this is your real problem. Now, what I want you to do is when you go see your clinician, talk about that, right? Because that's also a struggle for the VA and, and other clinicians is it takes sometimes years to get through the, the walls that we put up, right? And earn that trust. So what I'm trying to do for them as a support function, and apparently they like it because they send people to me, but it's to really get down to the meat and potatoes of what's going on and that they can dive in and start working. Right. And so, and the faster we're able to work with these folks, the less chance or less time for suicide. So. Yeah. Great. So if, is there something that you would offer as a piece of advice to anybody, whether a veteran or a non-veteran who has maybe been locked into one function, one purpose for so long, and then that's gone and, you know, they have to recreate their identity and find their footing in a world that seems completely off to them or different? Yeah. You know, um, obviously my identity was being a soldier and I really loved it. I was pretty good at it. And, and uh, when that ended abruptly, <laughs> it wasn't my choice. 
Uh, and a lot of times things that, that we want to do or that we've done that, that confirm who we are, sometimes that does end abruptly. Um, then we have to realize that we're not one trick people, right? We're not, there's, there's a lot of other things that we can do. Like for example, serving for me, right? It was more about, I wanted to serve others versus I wanted to be a soldier, right? When I started really digging deeper into myself and being more introspective, I realized that I want to serve in whatever capacity it just so happened. I served here for a little while as a soldier, but it doesn't mean I can't serve somewhere else. And just, just really figuring out the, the basis of, of, um, what you want to do, right? What you're passionate about and just going out and doing that and, and learning to close one chapter and start another, it's difficult, right? But it is possible. And, and you just got to be thankful for that opportunity that you had, right? And just realize that our, our life is just a, a bunch of chapters and they're not always consecutive. They, they don't always run, you know, in the same direction. Sometimes you come back to what you started with. Sometimes it's something new, but just, just trust life, right? Trust the process. And for me and my faith, my identity now is, is, in, is in my God, right? So uh, whatever it is that he wants me to do, I do. I don't, I don't fight what's natural. And that's what we do sometimes, right? We fight what may be natural because it may not be exactly what we want to do. Maybe it's not enough money. Maybe it's not the right hours. Maybe I don't get weekends off. But we, we got to quit fighting that and just let it organically happen. And that's sort of what I, I tell people. Nice. So can I ask you then, um, you said a couple of times your service ended abruptly, you were medically discharged. Yeah. You up for sharing how that, what's the story behind that? How, why did your service end? Yeah. Well, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, degenerative disc disease, you know, spinal stenosis, all these physical things. And, and once you get over a certain percentage, um, of, of what they consider disability, then, then you, you, you're no longer. They discharge. Right. Yeah. And I hate, like, just to say that just drives me crazy. I, right? I'm like, I still can walk and stuff. Like, let's go, you know, let's take yeah. the hill. But, but in reality, that doesn't work. And, and I understand it from your perspective too. Uh, but yeah, so that's what, that's what happened, you know, and then they're, you know, they're like, well, we, we can't stay. And I'm yeah. like, man, so, and, and really that was like a tough pill to swallow because I'm like, oh, so, so now I'm not good enough. Right. Right. So you took my best years. Right. And, and I did everything you asked me to do to the best of my ability. And I was dedicated. I mean, so much sacrifice, right. goes into service. I sacrificed a lot, you know, yeah. uh, some family stuff and time with my kids. And now all of a sudden, Hey, Jeremy, no, you're, you're not good enough because we have this revolving door of these 17 year olds who are healthy. Yeah fit that want to come in and, and uh, we're going to use them up first. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so, so a little bit of, yeah. I felt used a little bit, but then, then, you know, that's the thing. It's all about perspective. I, I was in that victim mentality. Right. And so then I started to think about, well, wait a minute, let's think about what the military is. Right. We got to know that they need the best, healthiest people to do this work. Right. And, and if I'm not, then I'm a liability, not only to myself, but to others around me, right? And I was, a, you know, I was a leader. And so, um, what if I would have went back in the country and, and had a bunch of triggering things happen, and maybe I didn't make the right decisions or the smart decisions? Then I was, a, I was now a liability versus an asset. And so I understood that, you know. And so, what what changed the game was I just started to uh, acknowledge that. Hey, I did that, and that was great, you know. And I was good at it, and I can accept that my times it's up. My time's up and, and uh, not everybody's on the same path. And, and once I got, um, got into that mindset of being okay with that, that's when life started to turn around. Things started to fall away, right? When I started saying, Hey, I'm not, I'm not broken or a victim because of this. Like it's a new chapter. And so what I've been doing, what I'm doing now, absolutely not. This would have been my 20th year. Maybe if I would have survived, I mean, who knows? Right. And then I would have been, but I wouldn't have been able to do this. And this, this for me, I think is, a greater um, way to serve than what I was doing there. It's more impactful to more people, right? Like I was one of a bunch in the military, right? Let's be honest here though. I'm able to really reach out and touch people here in this state. Like we started this organization. My idea was if we can get 11 or 12 people together and hang out, that would be great. Sometimes that was it. And now we have 1800, you know, veterans and organization, we're doing a bunch of cool stuff. And I would have never been able to tell you that that was going to happen, but I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it to still be in the military. Does that make sense? Yeah. Sometimes we just got to trust the process and just know that we don't always know what the future looks like or really even what's best for us going forward. Like things organically happen how they should. I believe in that. So. 
Awesome. So if people want to find out more about the Veterans Club and get behind it or maybe use that as a template to create their own program in their own state, where can they go to to find out about it? So they, they can go to Veterans Club on Facebook, uh, Veterans Club Kentucky on Instagram. They can go to our website at www.veteransclubky.com. Maybe I should slow that down. <laughs> veteransclubky.com. And um and get in touch with us there. I'd love for people to get in touch. And if anybody wants to do sort of the same thing, like I'm not one of those guys like, no, this is my thing. Right. Like I want, I want everybody to get involved. Like it takes a village. I, I want to work with everybody. And so I'm, I'm not going to hold back any of our ways of doing things just because we don't want someone else to do it. I want everybody to do it right. I want so much support for veterans that they, they can't even do everything in a week, you know, and that's kind of the go. And so, yeah, they can get a hold of me that way. Uh, they can email me at louisville.veterans at gmail.com as well. And uh, I'm real good about getting back with people. Great. Jeremy, thank you so much for all you do and for taking the time to sit down with us today. Absolutely. Thank you.